Cyber capacity building is a word that governments and other actors love to throw around. But like other terms in the cyber universe, it covers many issues and its precise meaning is often unclear. Context is important. In some situations, the term might refer to the effectiveness or security of technologies. In others, it might mean confidence building between states. Despite or perhaps because of its vagueness, it's become a popular buzzword and has made it onto government agendas around the world. In this video, we'll be focusing on the development and educational side, looking at what cyber capacity building means from the bottom up. From a development perspective, the United Nations defines capacity as the ability to perform functions, solve problems and achieve objectives. Capacity building aims to improve these abilities at different levels, individual, institutional and societal. By the end of this video, you should understand what cyber capacity building is, both as a process and a policy issue, who the relevant actors are and where they operate, and how to get involved as a human rights defender. From a development perspective, cyber capacity building has three common applications. The first is digital literacy, or in other words, knowing how to use information technologies. An example of capacity building here could be helping a school or university develop a course focusing on computer skills. The second is digital development. This describes the digitization of administrative processes and services by governments and the private sector. These are often aimed at creating new opportunities for participation or strengthening the market. For example, the digitization of public services, libraries or consumer platforms. And the third is ICT4D, or ICT for Development. This refers to ways that information and communication technologies can be used to support development goals, particularly those relating to social, political and economic development. As with the confidence and security building measures explained in the last video, one thing should be emphasised. Cyber capacity building is much more than just a one-off event or training. It should be a comprehensive human rights-based process that ensures learning and understanding and which allows time for reflection and forming positions on the issues involved. The end result? People who are confident in their ability to engage in policy making that considers all aspects of the debate, from security to culture, development to legislation. This understanding of cyber capacity building allows us to design comprehensive and empowering security solutions, effective approaches to good governance, and policies which make full use of the benefits of the digital age. So why does this matter for human rights defenders? Won't these cyber capacity building initiatives be rights respecting by design? After all, aren't they about development, not security? To answer this, let's revisit our definition of cybersecurity. The preservation, through law, policy, technology and education, of the availability, confidentiality and integrity of information and its underlying infrastructure so as to enhance the security of persons both online and offline. All of these things are, for obvious reasons, crucial to the enjoyment of human rights and they're just as pertinent to cyber capacity building initiatives focused on development as to anything else. These initiatives, however worthy, often involve the collection, storage and analysis of large amounts of data, which opens them up to potential abuse. They may involve the digitization of formerly slow offline processes, like moving visa application services online rather than queuing at different departments. But if these large collections of data are stored without adequate protections or misused by those in charge, human rights are put at risk. While an education initiative might teach more people to code, it might not teach them how to do it ethically. And just because a capacity building initiative is development focused, it can still end up focusing on the capacity of systems and states rather than capacities of individuals. Human rights defenders therefore have a crucial role to play in ensuring these initiatives are conducted in line with human rights and ethical standards from the very beginning. Cyber capacity building initiatives are being put in place nationally, regionally and internationally across a range of different forums. Major confidence and security building measures are being developed by the United Nations, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and others. 
Aside from these, there are more development-focused action plans being adopted at the regional and international level by organizations such as the African Union, the International Telecommunications Union, the Organization for American States, the Association of the Southeast Asian Nations, and the G8, now G7. However, none of these initiatives have yet agreed on a common understanding of cyber capacity building, let alone one based on human rights. Even the UN Sustainable Development Goals, adopted in 2015, don't achieve this. They include activities which refer to cyber capacity building, but, as they're not legally binding, there is a risk that these activities won't translate into action on a large scale. Similarly, a range of capacity building programs launched by the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank and the African Development Bank aim to support regional or national cyber capacity building efforts. However, they are rarely coordinated or designed with input from different stakeholders, preventing full buy-in. It's vital to make sure that these capacity building initiatives take a comprehensive approach that looks at all considerations in this emerging field, including security, human rights, education and trade. Here are a few examples. Many state initiatives understand cyber capacity building in terms of digital development and digital literacy. For example, Bangladesh's national initiative, Digital Bangladesh, aims to use ICTs to digitize government administration and public services, roll out digital education materials, and ensure low-cost broadband across the country. However, as these efforts often lack inclusive policy-making processes, they can fall short of fully tackling the issues and may not address risks to human rights. For example, part of the Digital Bangladesh initiative included a relaunch of government websites, which resulted in the accidental publication of sensitive contact information of thousands of employees. Another example from Nepal uses the ICT4D approach to cyber capacity building. It shows how technologies can be used in support of developmental and social goals. A local NGO organised a series of capacity building events to help address gender equality and violence against women and strengthen the digital literacy of civil society. Their efforts resulted in the creation of an app called Self Help, which allowed users to send emergency messages to family and friends along with their GPS position. Data could then securely be forwarded to relevant authorities providing care and services. This initiative successfully used technology to address a significant social problem in the country. It addressed this issue by raising awareness, creating a practical tool and fostering multi-stakeholder relationships. While the issue of gender-based violence is not solved, this example shows how multi-stakeholder capacity building efforts that take a comprehensive rights-based approach to problems can bring us closer to practical solutions. There are too many other initiatives to mention, but a few others happening now include the Global Cyber Security Capacity Centre, the Alliance for Affordable Internet, the Fast Africa Campaign of the Web Foundation and programmes run by the Association for Progressive Communications, Deutsche Welle, Open Knowledge Foundation, the Diplo Foundation and Mozilla. These all contribute to a human rights-based understanding of education and development within the field of cyber capacity building, and all of them should be fully supported. Cyber capacity building is still a fairly new field. For human rights defenders, this can be both an opportunity and an obstacle for engagement. The good news, no one has set the rules yet. ICTs can be a powerful tool for economic and social development and human rights around the world. And civil society can play an important role in making sure these initiatives are designed in thoughtful and locally relevant ways. But debates on cyber capacity building are often still very narrow, focusing on building the capacity of states and the stability and security of their systems. Challenging this approach will only be possible if human rights defenders start setting the agenda. There are a few practical ways you can do this. Talk to your local decision makers. Engage in broader policy debates at the international level to ensure that human rights and development considerations are part of all cyber capacity building projects. Take part in capacity building initiatives to broaden your understanding of cyber issues so you can engage critically in debates. Use technology to get around traditional obstacles to capacity building, funds, time and travel. 
A mixture of online and offline initiatives can cut costs, create flexible learning formats and bring people together from all over the world. Thank you.